Mind and Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Nathan Price. Dr. Price has a PhD in bioengineering, and he's a faculty member at the Institute of Systems Biology. He's also the chief science officer at Thorne Health Tech, which is a company that seeks to empower individuals to live healthier and longer through personalized scientific testing and solutions. They provide a number of products that give people individualized data, educational resources, and products that support specific health goals and health needs actually spoke to Nathan on episode 37, I think, of the podcast. So he's been on before. And he came on this time to talk about his work at Thorne, as well as his new book that he co-wrote with Dr. Leroy Hood called The Age of Scientific Wellness, Why the Future of Medicine is Personalized, Predictive, Data-Rich, and In Your Hands. And so we talked about the book and its contents. It's all about you know using new technologies and new forms of testing to understand your own metabolism and your own physiology to supplement your life with consumables or change your lifestyle, whether that's related to exercise and activity or sleep or your diet to you know really take a more data-driven approach to optimizing your own health and your own wellness. So we talked about everything from aging, the difference between chronological age and your actual biological age, uh, health span versus lifespan. So not just how long you're living in terms of the number of calendar years you've been alive, but how much of your life is actually healthy where you're still vibrant and active and able to use your body. We talked about things like uh, metabolism and how the metabolism of the human body can or should be flexible. You should be able to switch between different metabolic states. We talked about taking a proactive approach to health, not just you know going to the doctor and thinking about medicine to fix things that are wrong, like diseases, but to actually lead a healthy life so you prevent things like disease from even arising in the first place. We talked about some personal examples from Nathan's life, how at one point he actually discovered that he was pre-diabetic and you know what he did to reverse that and get healthier, to lose weight, and to just be more metabolically healthy. We talked about the use of AI and machine learning and how those types of things can really supercharge our ability to uh, monitor and predict and regulate our own health and our own activity levels by you know parsing all of the data that you can obtain these days and actually using that to guide your lifestyle. And so if you're interested in personalized med- medicine, um, personalized health, using data to optimize your metabolism and lead a healthier life, the book that he wrote and the stuff that he does is really all centered around that and helping empower people to do that type of thing. So we talked about a bunch of different topics in biology that are related to that and some things that you can actually use or consume in your own life that will help you uh, have this more personalized approach to health and wellness. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, Give me a good review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you're listening there. Uh, Drop a comment into the comment section on Substack or on YouTube, and I will try my best to answer any questions or comments that you have there. And don't forget to sign up for the free weekly Mind and Matter newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. Also, check out the links in the episode description. They will show you how you can support the podcast further to help keep it going and keep it growing, as well as the links to Uh, Nathan's new book and to some other things that you might find useful from this discussion. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a product I use called Everyday Dose. They have created excellent coffee and matcha products with functional mushrooms and other supplements and less caffeine than traditional coffee or matcha products. I actually reached out to them because I've been using their product for about a year or so and listeners often ask me about my daily and weekly diet habits. They make a really good mushroom-based coffee alternative. It contains micronutrients with antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties as well as collagen protein to help support healthier skin, nails, hair, and joints. And the amino acid L-theanine from tea leaves. Each cup has just about 39 milligrams of caffeine. That helps eliminate the caffeine crash that can come if you drink regular coffee, which has much higher caffeine levels. And they use a unique cold extraction process that results in lower acidity than normal coffee. And the caffeine microdose makes it suitable even for someone who doesn't normally drink coffee. This mushroom-based product is made using a double extraction from 100% mushroom fruiting bodies like lion's mane and chaga to maximize the extraction of micronutrients like beta-glucans, tritrate, 
benzodiazepines, and sterols. Other brands don't typically do this, making Everyday Dose one of the highest quality products of its kind. It's gluten, dairy, and nut-free. There's no added sugar. It's paleo and keto-friendly and made with kosher ingredients. There are no grains or fillers, and it is lab-tested to ensure quality. I really like the taste of Everyday Dose compared to black coffee and other mushroom coffees, and they have a mushroom matcha product loaded with functional mushrooms and collagen proteins, so if you like green tea matcha, you'll probably like that product too. If you're interested in a healthy coffee alternative, I highly recommend giving Everyday Dose a try. Check out the link in the episode description or visit everydaydose.com to learn more. If you go there, you can find special offers that they have for getting a free frother and free travel pack of on-the-go doses with your purchase. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen, and it's a handheld, pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy-to-use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters to get $50 off your Lumen device today. And with that, here's my conversation with Dr. Nathan Price. We've been building that around these uh, digital twin technologies. Uh, so we've built a ca- uh, capacity for uh, doing a really deep model of how the brain maintains health. So we've gotten into that in a, in a very big way. And then like a lot of other people, we're just really looking at AI, you know, and I did this article in the Wall Street Journal last weekend for the, you know, on AI uh, that Lee and I did, and it's just going to revolutionize everything. So the ability to do personalization next year is radically better than this year. Two years will be radically better than next year. I mean, it's just moving so fast. It's that super exciting. I I Mm -hmm. can hardly wait to get that stuff built. So, uh, What's like your best selling product at Thorn? Is it like a test, like one of like something you just described, or is it like a, a an actual consumable product? So the bet so the the natural products, the supplements are the biggest sellers. We have about 200 of those. There's no single product that dominates sales, though. I don't think there's any product that's more than about five percent. One of the things I like about that as a scientist is that, you know, as I can, I feel totally free to just evaluate evidence around anything and mm-hmm. like it, not like it or whatever, because we're not, you know, Thorne's bottom line is just not tied to any particular product. What it has is just a really broad portfolio. So you can do a lot of personalization. So I like that. And then on the testing side, the number one selling test that we have is the microbiome. Mm. And so- the really cool thing with the microbiome at Thorne is that we invented this thing called the microbiome wipe. And so this is uh, basically special, just what it sounds like, special toilet paper. So, you know, if people have done their own microbiomes, then it, there's a step that people really don't like, which is you have to, you know, poop in a bucket or on a piece of paper. You got to take a little scoop. You got to scoop up a little bit of the, of the poop and uh, put it into a vial you, some of the tests actually require freezing and I don't know what you keep in your freezer, but <laughs> keep food in our freezer. And so it's, you know, we usually don't have a separate sample freezer laying around. So there were all these issues. So what we did with the wipe was, was to come and figure out you know, what, what we thought was the easiest possible way to collect a sample. And so you just wipe like mm-hmm. you normally would, but it's a special polymer Mm -hmm. You put it in a vial and close it and you shake it. And within 10 seconds, it dissolves away. And, you know, that becomes, and then you, uh, anyway, you release a salt solution, preserves the DNA. We showed that you could get high quality DNA in a paper for frontiers and immunology. 
and it just makes the collection experience a lot better. So that, anyway, that's that's become our mm-hmm. our number one selling test. What um, what would what would that look like for for a typical person? So let's say they do that test and they get their results back. What exactly do the results look like? And you know, let's say that their microbiome isn't quite optimal, whatever that means. How how would they know that? And then how would they start to change that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the science on the on the microbiome is continuing to evolve and we learn more and more every year. But I would say there's already quite a lot that you can say off of getting your microbiome done. So some of the categories that we look at are digestion. So, you know, your microbiome contributes substantially to the breakdown of different foods. Uh, you can get negative aspects of that. Uh, for example, if you have bacteria that are making uh, too much ammonia, uh, that can cause your stomach to become more basic and not break down foods as well. Like that's a, that's an example. Mm. Uh, a lot of uh, just vitamins and nutrients that you need in your body are produced in the microbiome. So uh, if you have a mic, you know, a microbiome, and we look at the gene content across all the species, but if we don't see any. Uh, genes that are associated with the production of, say, some of the vitamin Bs, mm-hmm. uh, methylfolate, uh, which is uh, one. Actually, I just I just did my microbiome test. I was deficient in that, and there was no evidence I was making that in my microbiome. So, you know, just something to look at and say, okay, I'm that's a production capability you'd like to be there that isn't. Uh, serotonin, one of the most important uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, uh, I think the latest evidence is that 95% of the serotonin. Uh, that you use is actually made in your gut. That was a surprising uh, paper from a few years ago. And so, you know, you would want to look at that gut brain access. So that's another area that we look at pathogens, right? If you just have something that causes disease, uh, you can see that in these kind of reports. Uh, The thorn microbiome test is not a clinical test. So, you know, there would be a doctor or something on the back end that would call someone if there was a, you know, a significant issue, but you do see those things. And then, uh, and probiotics. So if there's something that you're taking as a probiotic and you want to see if it, is it actually getting into your gut and staying there? You can see that in the reports. Uh, and so we've tried to cover pretty much all the probiotics that we know about that are used, you know, at some scale in the community. And so you can watch that and just see, Hey, am, am I getting the benefit that I'm supposed to be getting? Because a lot of probiotics. Uh, you can take and they won't actually get into your gut and stay there because they have to outcompete the bacteria that are already there. And those they've been successful in living there. They're very competitive because they already won a whole bunch of times in a row. And so when you introduce probiotics, it's not a given that that they'll actually engraft and stay with you. So all those kind of things are things you can pull off of these kind of reports. Interesting. And um, so what's this new book all about? Yeah. So the new book uh, is called The Age of Scientific Wellness, uh, Why the Future of Medicine is Predictive, Preventive, Data-Rich, and In Your Hands. And it's a book that Lee Hood and I uh, wrote together. Uh, and for listeners that don't know, Lee Hood is a um, very famous scientist, uh, invented automated DNA sequencing that made the Human Genome Project possible, and won the National Medal of Science from President Obama, amongst other things. So what we really set out to do was to talk about how healthcare is too focused now on care after illness. And that starts all the way back from the beginning of the research enterprise, all the way through how care is delivered and the economics by which we reward pharmaceutical companies or doctors or healthcare systems. It's all focused around disease and especially late stage disease. And so the the argument in our book is that this approach is not terribly successful against the chronic diseases that plague us most. And that while we had an incredible success last century against infectious disease, um, if you fast forward to the chronic diseases that we deal with now, it's not a great strategy to wait until you have that disease. Because when you were talking about getting sick from a pathogen, there's this find it and fix it, right? You find it, kill the pathogen, Mm -hmm. you recover. With a chronic disease, you're talking about a lot of specific and personalized problems that are in your system. And if you wait till you have these late stage symptoms, it can be very difficult, if not nearly impossible, to reverse back to where you were in health. And yet for many of these things, prevention is a much, much easier task 
and it and it results in much more high quality life to the patient. And so our point of view is that if we shifted the focus of healthcare to much more towards the extension and expansion of health span, you know, slowing your rate of aging, slowing your rate of of moving into negative health, that we would have a much cheaper system that delivered many more years of positive healthy life than what we get now. And so the book goes into a kind of an extraordinary amount of detail around studies and science and what's emerging over the last several years of why we think this is something that is a a worthwhile vision and actually something that is worth striving for and and becoming doable in certain pockets today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like when you think about <clears throat> quality of life, I think you use the term health span. So thinking about health span versus lifespan, everybody knows what lifespan is just, you know, how many years have you've been around. And we all know that historically that has gone up, right? People in general, on average, most places, most of the time are living longer and longer, but they're not necessarily living longer in good health. Oftentimes, you know, that extra 10 or 20 years that we've got compared to what people were, were living, you know, a century or two ago is not necessarily a healthy 10 or 20 years. Um, you might have various chronic diseases and you might not be very active. So is there really like a number that can be measured for health span? Is that something that's changing that that people are going to be thinking about more? Like when you go to the doctor, they'll know not just what year you were born and, and how old you are, your lifespan, but but actually have something like a health span number that they can point to and, and use as kind of a, a guidepost for what you should be doing. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not used that much today, but under this concept of scientific wellness, that's exactly right. Like that's the number you're actually trying to maximize. And if you look at another just really beautiful book that was written a few years ago uh, by Atul Gawande uh, called Being Mortal, probably aware of this book, very famous book. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it talks about the end of life. And in our current paradigm, we have this yeah, there's this vision of, oh, if I'm extending my life, I'm living in a hospital, I'm uncomfortable, I'm unhappy. And I, most people would very logically say they don't want to extend their life. And if you look at where we spend a lot of our money, if you when you when you ask people when they're young and healthy, younger or unhealthier, how they want to die, they'll always say they'd rather die a little bit earlier, but they'd rather die at home and with their family. And yet 90 plus percent of us will die in a hospital artificially kept alive, you know, for longer periods of time, which is what a tool uh, Gawande's book is really about. And so that's kind of this dystopian situation that we're in. And we spend, I, I forget the exact number, but it's, it's some high percentage, like 40% of healthcare dollars or something are spent on that last bit of your life. And so what we want to do is refocus and reframe medicine such that you are trying to extend that that health span so that you are vibrant and active and enjoying your life into your 90s maybe even in, into your hundreds although that gets into some genetics and and some life extension kind of uh, arguments uh, but that's really the goal is is how do you stay as young and vibrant and and healthy as possible and then how do we refocus healthcare so that it's actually focused on that because right now if you think about almost every test that you take in medicine is, do I have this disease? Do I not? Right. And you're trying to find a disease, Mm -hmm. but wouldn't you rather understand, you know, am I getting biologically younger? What's the, what's the pace of my biological aging? Have I slowed it down? You know, am, am I good at, you know, there's pre-diabetes. So you get into things like, am I controlling glucose? Well, right. That's an important, very important piece of, of healthy aging. But am I, is my body good at combating oxidative stress? Is it getting worse at that? If so, why is it getting worse? How do we make it better? Is it better at dealing with um, uh, chronic inflammation, et cetera, et cetera? And you can just imagine a, a, a pro- pro- proliferation of lots of these different metrics for wellness that can be improved as opposed to just, do I have a disease or not? And so how does... You know how much of this ties into technology and requires people to, you know, buy testing kits or download apps and you know have stuff on them that that they're looking at every day and and seeing the line go up and to the right or down to the right or whatever. 
Yeah, I think that that's really an exciting element is the degree to which you can see in wearables and so forth if you're actually making progress. One of the conversations we've been having a lot around my house is, you know, my wife's been working out a ton in the morning and, you know, there's these cardiovascular scores that hers just keeps ticking up at a pretty fast rate right now. Uh, and it's a, a positive thing to be able to watch that and see, oh, okay, the computed VO2 max is getting better. You're seeing progress. You're seeing, you're seeing benefit. And you can actually look and track that on a day-to-day basis, which I think is is exciting. Uh, flip side of that is you know, people can get warning signs if they're, you know, if they're, um, you know, even things that look like uh, that are monitoring their heart health, for example, or you can get pings about warning signs or things to improve. And just the, the degree to which this is extending in a, and uh, accelerating, I think is just super exciting. Uh, and you mentioned um, you mentioned the brain health test, and it's a little bit easier to imagine, you know, thinking about you know your your VO two and your CO two levels and your breath. These things can be measured pretty easily, um, you know, counting steps, counting uh, heart rate, BPMs, and all that stuff. How do you how do you know what kind of tech is out there today that allows people to assess anything about their brain health? Yeah, so brain health is one of the really important factors for enjoying a long health span, for sure. And we don't typically treat it in a really proactive way in healthcare system. And and for a long time, it was really fairly taboo to talk about brain health issues because no one wants to admit that there's a problem with the brain. And I think that's starting to shift in our society where there's a lot more openness uh, to this now and working with healthcare professionals on this. So if you want to monitor the health of your brain, there's a bunch of different things you can do and different buckets to look at. So one is certainly through cognitive assessments. Uh, one company that I like quite a lot is called Posit. We we talk about them quite a bit in, in chapter six of the book. Uh, this is a company that comes out of work from Mike Merzenich, uh, uh, who's uh, emeritus professor at uh, at UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, he's a very eminent uh, neuroscientist. He actually won the Kavli Prize, which, for those that don't know, is basically the Nobel Prize of neuroscience. Except it's about, I think, three times larger in terms of the size of the award. Uh, it's this uh, massive prize that they put together. But it's a um, and so what he's really studied is brain plasticity. So, you know, how malleable is, is your brain? And so they've put together a set of cognitive assessments and then uh, cognitive exercises that you do in order to improve the health of your brain. And the reason that we like what Mike has done is he's published, I think, well over 200 studies now on this in the scientific literature. So he's got, uh, you know, substantial evidence behind what they do. But the idea is just like with muscles, when you're trying to do progressive overload, this is essentially the same idea of progressive overload, but applied to the brain, which is, of course, a physical object that has certain properties. So it will test things like processing speed. And so it will push you to your absolute edge and figure out how fast you can process certain kinds of information. And it will try to push you as far as you can go, which is what makes it more like progressive overload. So it's not like just doing a crossword puzzle or something like that. You're not really at your capacity. Mm -hmm. These these tests will push you to, you know, what's the fastest that you can recognize an object, right? And so it'll flash it for, you know, fraction of a millisecond down to it finds like what's your absolute limit. And then it it pushes that limit until you make it a little bit better and so forth. Uh, So with processing speed, with memory, with, um, with perception. And so that's one bucket that I think is is very interesting. And they have a product called Brain HQ. Uh, I have no affiliation to it, so I have you know, no financial stake in it at all. But it's it's a product that we think is is a good one for that. A second is that uh, our blood measures. So so it, you know the thing that we worry about a lot with brain health, you know, later stage of course is dementias and Alzheimer's disease and things of that nature. So there are measures that you can look at in the blood. And we will put a number of these into a into the test that we'll launch from Thorne later this year. But there are a bunch of different um, factors. Some of them are just very basic things. So one is inflammation. 
So you can monitor, for example, CRP. So you want to keep lower. Uh, there are associations with vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency is um, strongly associated with a higher uh, degree of, of incidence of dementia. So you'd want to watch for that. Uh, Omega-3s uh, is another one uh, that you might, you might look at. Uh, the biggest factor, though, I think, is really keeping high oxygenation to your brain. Uh, so one of the triggers for dementia, at least uh, under our model for it, is that you your neurons have struggle to make enough energy to stay alive when they get under low oxygen conditions. And as you get older, this has all been measured, your ability to perfuse oxygen through the blood into your into your brain as you get older goes down. So as that as that gets squeezed, it becomes harder for neurons in certain parts of your brain to maintain enough energy to stay alive. And so when that threshold flips and they can't satisfy the amount of energy that they need to stay alive, they'll die. And so once some of your neurons are dying, that puts a lot of more stress and pressure onto the other neurons and they have to make more energy. But as that, so as supply is going down, demand is going up and every time it flips, you lose more and you get this cascade that leads to uh, loss of cognition in your synapses and so forth. And so another huge factor then is to monitor, and this is why exercise is protective against Alzheimer's, by the way, mm. because you're, you're, you're able to keep that perfusion rate high. And so anything that you can do to maintain that becomes really important. And in fact, under hypoxic conditions uh, in, in these digital twin models that we've built, uh, basically one of the things we see is that as you go into under these lower oxygen or hypoxic conditions, that as you get into that lower oxygen, and we run simulations on how you maintain energy under that under that load. You turns out you a certain nutrient becomes um, rate limiting, uh, which is phosphatidylcholine, and so you literally run out of that. At least you know in the in the studies that we've done, and so so that's another thing you can do is you can actually just supplement with something like phosphatidylcholine to keep that nutrient higher. So that you have more of a capacity to generate energy under low oxygen conditions. Mm -hmm. So that can make a difference and so forth. So there's all kinds of things you yeah. can do. So what is phosphatidylcholine? So it's got choline in the name. So I think of acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, but what is this thing doing sort of at the molecular level in terms of its physiological, you know, where it plugs into, you know, just our metabolism, generally speaking, and is it something that you can get in the diet from certain foods? You can. So you can get you can get this in the diet from eggs, for example, is probably the you know the the highest source uh, of where you can get that. Uh, you can also um, you can you can supplement with it if you want to just get it specifically as at a higher level. Um, and so the so the phospholipid part. So this is going to relate to um, to functions such as integrity of the membranes, and then it also gets trafficked in the cell as part of um, as part of the process by which you generate energy from astrocytes to support neurons. So what happens in, in the brain is that you have, uh, so astrocytes will create a lactate. There's this thing called a lactate shuttle. And then the lactate will get uptaken by the neurons and it uses that as a source for it to generate energy. And so when we run that as a complex simulation, uh, that under those conditions, dealing with this cholesterol trafficking, uh, which is a really important part in, in Alzheimer's, that's where when we run the simulation that phosphatidylcholine is in part a key input for that metabolic process. And it, at least in the simulations that we run based on data from about 900 different papers, but in the models that we run, that becomes rate limiting, you run out of it. And that's one of the triggers then for the neuronal death. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about cholesterol? Because cholesterol is super interesting and I think people are really confused about it in general. Um, on the one hand, you often learn that cholesterol is essential. It does like super important things that have to do with the way our cells work. But on the other hand, it's really got a lot of negative connotation associated with it. Um, you don't want your cholesterol to be too high. You don't want to eat too much cholesterol. That's that's a common belief out there. So, so what is cholesterol doing and how should people think about cholesterol in their diet? Yeah, you're exactly right. Because you 
you know, cholesterol is a, is essential for life. So you've got to have some of it, but we, we know that, you know, really high cholesterol levels are associated with um, cardiovascular disease uh, and also can become a problem, you know, with uh, neurological issues uh, as well. So one thing I, I do want to point out though, is that this can be personalized to quite a high extent. So let me just give you an example. So we did a study a few years ago uh, where we were taking people through a wellness program. So they're trying to get healthier. And one of the markers that we measured amongst thousands of others was LDL cholesterol, right? So LDL cholesterol in the blood is used for diagnosis of a problem, often for prescription of statins and so forth. And I'll leave aside right now that, you know, particle size is what matters the most and, and so forth. But let's let's just talk about that for a moment. So one of the questions we had as we put people through this program was whether or not through lifestyle intervention, you would be successful at lowering your LDL cholesterol. And when we, when we ran uh, several you know, thousand people through this program, and when we did that, it turned out some people were able to lower their LDL cholesterol and some not. And that's kind of what's been seen in a bunch of studies. Now, what was interesting in the studies we did, because we had this huge amount of data that we generated, including genomics, was it turned out that who was able to lower their LDL cholesterol versus not was predictable. And so, and it was predictable from the genome. Mm. And so the, the key thing that mattered is that, so if I have your genome sequence, then, you know, we are able to do a calculation that would that would predict what your LDL cholesterol level would be. That's absent of lifestyle or anything else. And it, it captures, when we did the paper, it captured about 11% of the variance in terms of the total variability. So lifestyle matters more, but, but you get a signal. Uh, now the genetic signal, because these have gotten so much better over the last few years, is up to about 20%, a little over 20%. So what that means then is you get a prediction for your LDL cholesterol on a per person basis, and then you can compare that to the actual level. Now, if there's a gap, so mm. if someone has high LDL cholesterol, but their genome predicts low, those individuals by and large were able to reduce their LDL cholesterol by lifestyle. However, if they had high LDL cholesterol and their genome predicted high, i.e. there wasn't much of a gap. We did not, we saw no statistically significant change in their LDL level at all. And that's across thousands of people. So what this means is that we, we have the ability to understand something that's a totally new category of variable into healthcare. Because today we just treat, you know, high, L, high cholesterol against a population average, right? That's what, and there's a range and you're high and that's it. But with genome, genomics, you can actually personalize that and introduce the notion of the delta or the gap between your measure and the prediction from your mm -hmm. genome. And that lets you know what's changeable. And it's not just true for LDL cholesterol. We looked at this for HDL cholesterol in terms of what you might want to raise. We looked at it for hemoglobin A1C, a marker for prediabetes, and on and on. And so you can, you can amplify that in the healthcare system across basically every single biomarker and know how does this compare to your genetic prediction? And I'll you know, and I'll argue that that will turn out to be uh, much more informative than just the marker alone. Mm. So if people have naturally high LDL levels and they are supposed to have that, uh, quote unquote, because, because of their genome, is that still predictive of, of cardiovascular risk or, or is it really about this gap between what your genome um is is expecting or, or telling your body where those LDL levels should be and where they are compared to that based on your lifestyle? It's a great question. And the answer is that we don't fully know yet because there are at least two possibilities, right? Which is that you have the genetics for high LDL. You're, so the first possibility is you're just dealt a bad hand, right? You're dealt a bad hand and we're going to have to deal with it, but it's going to be hard for you to change by lifestyle. So very likely you need a drug solution or mm -hmm. something like that. The second possibility, which you just raised, is that that LDL cholesterol level is actually not so worrisome for you because based on your genetics, you have a different steady state. Therefore, the marker is just not as, it's not as meaningful for you. So I'll get, I'll, uh, so for cholesterols, I think we've still got to dive in and really understand that. We're trying to 
figure out some big populations where we can ask that question and, and, and nail that down so we know for sure. I'll give one other example, though, which is for hemoglobin A1C. So for hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for prediabetes and diabetes, there more is understood about the potential mechanism. So there are genetics that are associated with residence time of red blood cells. So red blood cells will circulate in your body and they do so for about 120 days. But based on your genetics, you might have higher or lower amounts of time. So let's just say that you had a hemoglobin year that your hemoglobin is circulating your bot, your red blood cells are circulating for 130 days. And let's say mine are circulating for 110 days. So we're at opposite ends of that, that spectrum. So if we had exactly the same hemoglobin A1C measurement, and just to remind people, hemoglobin A1C is the accumulation of sugar molecules on the outside of hemoglobin. Mm. And it's the amount that they accumulate over the lifespan of you know, the time the protein is there in, in the red blood cells. So if we had the same, let's say borderline hemoglobin A1C of being a pre-diabetic pushing towards diabetes risk, if you were circulating for 130 days, and I'm circulating for 110, my measurement would be much more worrisome mm -hmm. because my mine has accumulated that amount in in less time than yours did under that you know that hypothetical, and so so that's a case where I think it's quite clear that the genetics would not suggest that the hemoglobin is A1C is uh, is that's not an argument that it's different in terms of its risk. In that case, it would just be difference in interpretation. So mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things we can get into, and it's going to be different answers for different biomarkers, depending on the mechanism. But I think it's one of the most important uh, frontiers in medicine right now, which is to figure out how do we reinterpret all of these markers that we use for, uh, for you know, diagnosing disease in this case, and how do we refactor them, understanding what we know about the genome and personalizing that for every person. You know, for, Mm -hmm. uh, personalize that across the board. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about like the cholesterol example, some people have this gap where their genomic data tells us they should have relatively low LDL levels, but in fact, you measure relatively high levels. That tells us that that gap is there. And also it can be closed because, um, because their genome allows for it basically. So for people like that, when you see them lower their cholesterol levels, by changing their lifestyle, where does that come from? Is it by just eating less dietary cholesterol? Does it come from somewhere else? And I guess the underlying uh, question here is like, when someone has uh, cholesterol levels that are too high, is that, do your cholesterol levels get too high because you're just eating a lot of cholesterol? Or are they high because something else is broken? And that's just sort of an indicator that something else is broken, but it doesn't necessarily have to do with how much cholesterol you're consuming. Right. Yeah. It's not just a function, certainly of, of dietary cholesterol. And I don't think the correlation is super, it's been a little while since I looked at that, but it's, you know, I, I don't recall that it's, that it's super high in that correlation. So there's a bunch of other factors that are going to matter. There's the usual things that always matter, which is how active you are, right? How much, um, you know, what your, what your, um, uh, your, uh, your BMI, although I'm, I'm hesitating because BMI has issues. And we can talk about, we actually came up with a new measure for BMI that we published in Nature Medicine last week. We can talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but, you know, where your weight is at, you know, do you have, if you're carrying around too much fat, that's going to have, you know, a big, a big role to play in this. So that these factors will, will adjust uh, to a reasonable degree based on those overall health metrics. And then there are other things you can do to just target, um, you know, these mole these uh, measures, even from just a natural st uh, product standpoint. So for example, a compound called berberine uh, has been shown in trials to, you know, lower uh, cholesterol using, you know, just a, you know, a natural product that you find in food. Uh, so there's different ways that you can try to have a subtle effect on this, but a lot of those just general overall health measures and just getting more active, getting your weight under control, all the usual stuff we think about will make a big difference there as well. Yeah. What, um, yeah, the gap. so, so yeah, uh, talk more about the BMI thing. So let's remind everyone like what BMI is and sort yes. of what it's, uh, what it's limits are. 
So BMI stands for body mass index. And so this is a metric that's basically just derived from two measures, which is your weight and your height. And so when you do this, you get a number that represents roughly speaking, uh, you know, whether or not you're in a healthy weight category or not. Now it breaks down in certain cases because, you know, if you're a champion bodybuilder or something like that, and you've got a ton of muscle, you're going to have a high BMI. And that doesn't mean what it means for most of us, which is that for most people, you're going to say you're carrying a lot of excess fat. So on average, it's not a bad measure. Uh, we estimate that it's probably a you know a mismatch about thirty percent of the time, and about seventy percent of the time, uh, it's you know a pretty pretty reasonable match. So across a population, it's it's not it's not bad, uh, but it does have limitations to it because it doesn't take into account you know, your fraction of protein to fat. I don't want to overstate that because look, for most people, if you have a super high BMI, it's really hard to get there on protein. <laughs> it's really easy to get there on fat. So it's you know in general not a bad metric. Now, what we did, and this was uh, led uh, by Noah Rappaport, who's a senior research scientist in um, my lab and Lee Hood's lab. Uh, she, uh, well, we did a study that we published in Nature Medicine a week or two ago. So it just came out called Biological BMI. So to do this, we took a population of about 5,000 people where we had measured genomes and metabolomes and proteomes. Uh, and that's people that aren't aware that, you know, so metabolomes is like all the metabolites in your blood, proteome, the proteins in your blood. Uh, we measured about a hundred and between hundred and 150 different clinical labs, uh, microbiomes uh, out of the gut. And we did this multiple at regular intervals over a few year period. And so one of the things we did was just to identify whether or not we could come up with a measure that was better by looking at especially these uh, metabolites that are in the blood to that would better represent a person's metabolic health than you get from a BMI measure. And we call this biological BMI. And so when we did that, what we found was that this biological BMI was more associated with health outcomes than was BMI itself. So being higher or lower on biological BMI was more predictive of whether or not you would you know, enter into a metabolic disease state, for example. And it was also more highly related to your gut microbiome. So if we try to say, all right, how, you know, the, the information overlap or that's shared between your gut microbiome and your biological BMI, that was stronger than your relationship between your microbiome and BMI itself. So just across a whole host of different analyses, what we found was that if you did this, this deeper dive, which would differentiate between the person that is, you know, that has the same BMI, but one might be much more metabolically healthier, they might have a better body composition, their body might just be able to deal with, uh, you know, different, um, you know, with glucose differently or different metabolic processes better and whatnot, that was really captured much better in this High dimensional biological BMI score than it was just the the simple measure. And so, how do how do people learn what that score is for them? Is there like a test for that? Yeah, so we'll we'll be developing a test around that. You know, we're still kind of figuring out what that looks like. Uh, I is the Institute for Systems Biology, where I've been a professor for many years. Uh, you know, did file a patent around this, so you know it's it's um, it's going to be commercialized in some form or another. So it's just kind of getting decided exactly how that will be, but we'll make sure that this becomes a test that is, you know, easily accessible for people. So I think there's just a bunch of discussions going on around, you know, how to get that out so individuals could do it. If the if you're the biohacker type, you can get the paper at Nature Medicine and you could get a, you know, you could get the measurements done uh, from a metabolomics test or something like that. And then apply the algorithm yourself, but it's not, it's not yet in a form, like I said, just got published a week ago. So it's not yet in a nice commercial form for people to analyze, uh, but we'll, we will have that in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I've been thinking about recently is this concept of, of metabolic flexibility. You know, it's like our cells can 
be in different metabolic states. They can use different sources of energy to create their molecular energy. They can, um, and they can switch, they can switch how they do things. So, you know, the example and example that many people may maybe have heard of is something like ketosis. So when you fast for an extended period of time, or you're eating this high fat, low carb diet, the ketogenic diet, your cells go from you know one metabolic state to another, and they start using different types of molecules to to do all their stuff, and this can have profound effects on just our general health. So that you know a very famous example is the ketogenic diet can be used to treat certain forms of epilepsy because it changes the metabolism of your neurons, but also just you know even outside of any specific disease state, it just changes your metabolism. So people report feeling different to their energy levels, changing um, this, that, and the other. And uh, I've been using this device for a few weeks. Um, have you seen this? It's like a breath breathalyzer type thing. It's yeah. called a lumen. A lumen so you, yeah. yeah. You inhale and exhale out of it for a few seconds. Apparently the way it works is it measures CO2 levels in your breath. And that is a proxy for, are you using mostly carbs versus mostly fats for, for energy? And you can get a snapshot of that at any given time, but it also captures how much you're changing from burning carbs to burning fats back and forth throughout the day and throughout the weeks. So th does that type of thing work? And is this idea of metabolic flexibility important that you should actually be able to pr fairly rapidly switch between how, how you're actually creating and using energy throughout your day? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, there are definitely differences in you know, the CO2 conversion and the, that ratio that you get between O2 and CO2 th that change depending on what you're metabolizing. So there's definitely a signal there that you can, you know, amplify and learn off of. There's there's massive flexibility in metabolism in humans. Going back a long time, but, you know, my, in my PhD, you know, the, the lab I was in, you know, that was one of the big efforts was to build out, you know, the first global model of human metabolism at a molecular scale and building that all out. So, you know, we used to get into these all, all, all the time and, and it's, uh, it's just a fascinating area that way. So there, there are all, um, so like you say, so there are signals that you can pull from that. Now, switching back and forth is, is another really interesting aspect of that because, you know, we've learned over the recent years, things like intermittent fasting, that if you spend more time away from food, there are all kinds of processes that happen, including autophagy, where you're recycling some of these broken materials from cells that are breaking down and, and getting them remade into you know, newer, cleaner cells, which is an important process. So you know, spending time not eating turns out to be really important for longevity. And there's, you know, that's really come around uh, in a lot of studies over the last several years. Uh, this notion of metabolic flexibility is also uh, really interesting from the standpoint that, especially if you're in a regime where, for example, you're trying to lose weight, then there's a benefit to, you know, a lot of people like, you know, to stay in ketosis because you're, you're basically breaking down fats, uh, under that model, you're using that as your primary energy source. So the notion is if you don't get yourself out of that, your body is staying in a state where it's a little easier for it to tap into your fat stores and, and burn them down. And so that that's quite interesting. There's a, an interesting company called Tecton, you know, that's been working on, you know, these ketone beverages. There's a there's a number of different ones, but that's that's the one that I know. Uh ketones are not the greatest tasting things in the world. They've worked really hard to make them better. So, you know, we 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 do keep them in the office. So I have them every once in a while. And I think it's, you know, so there are some of these products that are actually getting out there too along with just being very careful about, you know, the food that you eat, if you're, if you're wanting to stay in a state of ketosis. And I know that works really well for some people. And um, so in, so there's no one universal diet that'll work for everyone. And, you know, all, you know, the whole point of your book, I think, but one of the big points is, you know, personalization. Yeah. Um, you really have to think about this at the individual level. But one thing that seems pretty true, mostly true most of the time, um, for me or in our culture, at least, is that um, our diets have gotten proportionally higher in carbohydrates over time. And we're eating more and more carbs and sugars and things in that class. And this has probably a lot to do with things like diabetes and obesity, et cetera. So, you know, in terms of just basic macronutrients, um, 
should people be thinking, you know, if you had to simplify things as much as possible, should we be thinking about things like just decreasing our carbon take and or just doing intermittent fasting more, you know, in terms in terms of the basic macro- macronutrients and sort of when and how we eat, you know, directionally, what's going to work for for the majority of people in our culture? I think monitoring your macronutrients is really helpful and really important, but I'll, I'll talk about this in a few different ways. So first, the we have a massive overabundance in our society of processed carbohydrates. So these are simple sugars. These are the kind of things that will spike your glucose tremendously. One of the great instruments that you can use now are these continuous glucose monitors. Uh, they're primarily you know, used for diabetics, but there, you can also get them for, you know, other general health issues, you know, and I've worn these, you know, at two week intervals periodically for, you know, a few years as, as a number of others have, and you can, you can actually monitor lots of people's personal experiences on these, you know, on social media and so forth. So there's tons of data on this now, but you can see the degree to which you get spikes and these processed sugars uh, that you get in, you know, chips or candy or sodas, or, you know, you just get massive spikes and they're much more than we would ever experience from real food. So what that means is that our bodies aren't really adapted to deal with that kind of an insult over and over and over again, because in our, you know, natural lives, before we get, you know, got into all the modern processing that we do, you would never, never run into that. If you eat a piece of fruit, there's a bunch of sugar in there, right? There's fructose in there. But there's also fiber, right? There's there's pieces that are built in that that help to uh, blunt that that shock. So that's one, and that leads directly to the huge diabetes epidemic we have, and so forth. In terms of macronutrients, you know, one of the really big things, especially if people are trying to um, reduce their weight, which a lot of people are, of course, and they're trying is that is not to eat too little protein. So you want to keep your protein content as high as possible. And I do think good, you know, this is pretty generic advice that, you know, that people will go for, but the, uh, or that a lot of people give, but you want to have kind of as high a protein content uh, subject to the number of calories you're trying to hit. And one rule of thumb that I have found personally just super helpful is if you look at the number of calories that something has and you divide it by 10, that's roughly the amount of protein you'd like to have in it. So that mm-hmm. means if you're if you're targeting a, a diet of 1,700 calories, you would get 170 grams of protein. If anything, that's on the high side. You probably don't need to be quite that high. But if but one of the things that I found is just because it's so simple, and I've been using this a lot in my own life uh, uh, the last little while uh, because I think that this tip is so useful. So if I pick up something and I see oh it's 200 calories, well if it has 20 grams of protein or more, I think all right, that's good. That keeps me, you know, if it's 20, it's at level. And if it's higher than that, it's great. So like I have Greek yogurt almost every morning with, with berries or whatnot, but the Greek yogurt is, you know, it's for 90 calories, you get 18 grams of protein, which means it's double my target amount. So I know that that gives me something that's higher. And then if I'm going to have something that's lower, it gets balanced out. But I, I find that target, that very simple metric to be just super useful. And then, and the more that I focus on, okay, let's just make sure that everything that I do is, you know, averages out to around that target is, has been super helpful, super helpful for me so far. Yeah. Yeah. I had a conversation with a couple of guys who wrote a really interesting book um, a few weeks ago. The book is called Eat Like the Animals, but long story short, you know, they basically said what you just said and explained why they, you know, humans, and many other am- animals are a protein leveraged species, which you know, according to them, means um, you know, based on our history as a species and how we evolved, our bodies uh, want us to get uh, the minimum amino acid requirements fulfilled to you know build our muscles and just yep. you know build the the stuff of our body, and we'll be motivated to eat stuff until those amino acid requirements are are made. So, you know, over time as processed carbohydrates have become proportionally more more and more common, you know, the percentage of our diet that is protein has fallen, and so we just our bodies motivate us to keep eating until we get that minimum amino acid requirement met. So, you know, I think basically what you just said is if you keep your protein content relatively high, it doesn't need to be radically high, but if you bring it up relative to those processed carbohydrates, it's going to have a satiating effect. You're going to get everything you need and your body won't 
want to, to continue eating as much. It's exactly true. If you, if you focus on these macros and you're getting that level of protein, by and large, you won't overeat. But those simple processed sugars, and we all know this, right? You, if you eat a thousand calories of that, you'll be hungrier at the end than you were at the, at the beginning. And it also, the other thing about those processed sugars, and you can just look at it when you see sugar, what, you know, it looks a lot like cocaine or anything like that, right? It's a, it's a white bear. It's massively bioavailable and it hits the plant, the pleasure centers of your brain, which is why it's addictive. And so when you, you know, when you take these kind of things, it really reinforces and it gets you on a cycle that is incredibly hard to get off of. But if you stay away from it and you, enough so that you have your brain has a chance to re-equilibrate and you focus on, and I really like the, the positive of just focusing on the protein macros because you're exactly right. You don't have to feel deprived. You just make sure you're eating food that will satisfy you. And then you stop when you're full mm-hmm. and it's pretty, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. I mean, and we all know, you know, eating less sugar and processed food is hard because it does taste good and it does feel good. It is it is, sure. uh, <laughs> it is, you know, caloric cocaine, uh, so to yes, speak. Yes. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the, these, you know, uh, blood monitoring, you know, using, you know, I've done that a couple of times using literally the same thing that a diabetic would use to monitor their blood um, sugar levels. And one of the things that I learned there that was even more like insidious was um, things were, there were things that I was eating that was making my blood sugar spike that, uh, you probably think are healthy. So like I was eating a lot of quote unquote healthy cereal and you know, it had, it had the heart sticker on it. It said, you know, AMA approved heart, healthy, whole grains, no added sugar, blah, 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 blah. You know, every vitamin you can think of is on the nutrition facts, but it would make my blood sugar spike so much like more than anything. And there's a lot of that stuff out there that is sort of camouflaged as a uh, heart healthy that that really isn't any better and sometimes even worse than something that is you know eating a, a spoonful of sugar. Absolutely, there's so much of this that's just marketing. I I forget the guy's name. I I'm sorry, I don't remember it at the moment. But there are these. Uh, he makes these videos. He's an advertising guy, and he'll and he'll take a product, and he specializes in rebranding it as a health food. And he has taken, you know, very unhealthy food, you know, a soda full of sugar. And then, you know, how would he rebrand that to be something that is, you know, that's good for you. And there's all kinds of things that you can say on there. And and we saw that this was very commonly done earlier to what you take something that's full of sugar and you you put on the front fat free exclamation points. Like, yeah, it's literally straight sugar. There's no fat at all in there. And that's not even a good thing. If you're having some carbs, you really want some fats because it slows mm-hmm. it down and 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 things like that. Or, you know, there's all kinds of positive things you can that you can say on there, right? It's non-GMO, it's fat free, it's all natural, all natural, it's you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really can't go by marketing for what's healthy. So you're exactly right about that because it's such a and that's where I, I think being able to do measurements on yourself, whether it's a CGM or you're looking at your own blood measurements, you're looking at the, you know, the health indicators you can get off a of wearable or whatever it is, that you get a sense for what really is having an effect on your health. And the more you can get away from things that are you know, that are overly processed and so forth and not buy in too much to the the marketing around that, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, what about sleep and, and sleep tracking, um, how does sleep, you know, tie into metabolism and and what are the, are there convenient and non-invasive ways to monitor your sleep? Not just if you're sleeping or not, but you know, if you're going into deep sleep and things like that. Yeah, it's sleep is obviously one of the most important elements of health. And there are a lot of ways to track how you're sleeping now, you know, in addition to just kind of how you feel in your body. And I find those to be uh, very instructive. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of practical advice out there, you know, now that, uh, you know, around this. So one of the things that turns out to be really important is seeing sun, you know, seeing sunlight early in the morning 
and kind of getting a reset on your clock. Andrew Huberman's really popularized that and made everyone aware of that, you know, in the over the past uh, year or so. Uh, that's an important that's an important feature. There are a lot a lot of connections between sleep and dementia as well. And in fact, there was a study that showed that even small amounts of of sleep deprivation uh, you would lead to increases in beta amyloid levels in the in the brain. And that you know beta amyloid is a, is a good biomarker for you know something bad is happening in the brain. Uh, we can talk more about that. Uh, and so that is a, yeah, so there are these feedback loops that are are associated with this. And we've been building some, you know, some models around sleep that I think are are quite interesting. We're just delving into this a little bit more. But there, you know, there are these factors for when you go into, into sleep, uh, because sleep is such an interesting phenomenon, because, you know, we take our bodies offline for a third of the day, every day. And that is an incredibly dangerous thing to do in the wild. And yet we all do it and all these animals do it. <laughs> you know, so so the 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 needs there are really important. So so as you go through the process of thinking and living your life, you know, you you basically build up um waste products that have to be cleared uh in order for you to keep that process going. And so you, you get this sort of urgent need. And so one of the th triggers that has to get flipped is you actually have to go into a reverse cholesterol transport. So you're actually taking some of your basic metabolism and you're flipping it backwards in order to clear out some hmm. of this debris. And so when you do that, one of the things you're doing then is you're actually lowering the amount of available energy that you're generating because you're you're flipping some of these metabolic pathways in reverse. And so that immediately explains why your body has to shut down and end all motor function, right? So that you're there and you can't be operational while you do that. And you remember we talked earlier about, you know, in dementia is this, this notion of having to keep enough energy in your brain to keep it alive. And just, oh, just a basic fact that, that around this is your brain consumes 20% of your body's energy and it's 2% of your body's biomass. So your brain is a massive energy hog and you have to feed it energy all the time. So when, when you, when you take this metabolic pathway and sleep and you have to flip it. And in fact, this is why you go into um, deep sleep and REM sleep in this cycle, because you actually have to, to first, before you go in and you take this thing offline, you have to generate a bunch of ATP and, and, and store it up so that you can get through that next cycle and you've shut down your body so that you're not wasting any other energy anywhere else during that process because you've got to maintain that amount so that while you're doing the necessary cleaning in your brain you're not falling below threshold and you're not you know your neurons aren't dying mm -hmm. and that kind of process so so anyway we don't need to get into all the details on that but it becomes a really fascinating process about the physiologic physiologically what your brain is achieving during sleep and then and how you go around doing that we're actually pretty interested in that because you know maybe there's ways to optimize those processes you know yeah in, you know and kind of prime yourself for can you guarantee you have an amazing night's sleep every night you know, can yeah. we i don't know you know it's 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 gonna well, be super interesting yeah one of the things that kind of scares me about this area and I know that there's a lot more questions here than answers. We don't really fully understand it yet, but like, you know, the importance of cycling through those different phases of REM and non-REM, and it's actually that, that cycle that's important, not just that you are immobilized and asleep. Um, what, but the yep. part that scares me is like a lot of like SSRIs and pharmaceuticals actually suppress REM sleep. So people sleep the whole night, but they don't cycle through those phases of sleep the way that they're supposed to. Yeah. And that strikes me as a very serious problem. Yeah. Because those, just like you say, the cycling, the, the sleep cycles really, you know, make a, make a huge difference. And the timing is, is necessary in terms of how, you know, of how you cycle through. So it's, um, 
yeah, you've, you've just got to be very, very careful with that for sure. Yeah. I want to ask you a question too about just, you know, uh, it's like science communication. So, you know, you're coming onto podcasts, you're writing books. Um, you mentioned Andrew Huberman. I've listened to his podcast quite a number of times. He's become super popular. And like what I start to see when people become this popular is two things happen. Um, one, more people are listening to them. That's good. They're learning more science and they're becoming educated and they're learning things. But then two, you know, people you know, people like you and me, experts who have degrees and and they know about certain things, they, you know, they start to point out like, oh, well, you know, he said this one thing and it wasn't completely accurate, or this was simplified a little too much, or, you know, there's really only one study that showed that and it wasn't that big, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things are valid, but, you know, I think you and I probably both know that, you know, if you're packaging something from a for a public audience, you're trying to simplify things and use simple language as much as possible. You're talking about things that are super complicated, especially not not only are they inherently complicated, but you know if, if they're cutting edge. If you're talking about stuff that we're still very much learning about and discovering new things about, you know, I always tell people, look, it's impossible to get a hundred percent of things right a hundred percent of the time. And so, how do you thread that needle? of you know accuracy and simplicity and digestibility when you are speaking about these things when you're writing your book and when you're just just communicating and educating yeah it's a great question and it's interesting so you know in the book the age of scientific wellness you know, it was published through uh, the commercial arm of Harvard University Press. It is aimed to be a, a you know a general audience book so it's written at a level that you know that's accessible uh I think to pretty much anyone, but it was interesting because we turned it in initially a year earlier and our editor felt like we had gone too far in the direction of trying to simplify it. In fact, she, she wanted and, and wanted it sourced like an academic um, paper basically for every fact or every statement in the book. Hmm. And so I spent a massive amount of time over it. And it took me a whole year to go through and re and go through and re annotate everything in the book and have site. I think I added something like 350 citations into the book to verify as best as like, and I'm sure there are errors in there a hundred, a hundred percent. There's no way that there's not, but I tried my very best to not have, to not have that by going through every statement and our editor, Joy Domeno, she really, uh, really pushed that. A hard, and I'm really glad she did because the book is massively better after that year than it was before. Uh, and then the second time around, she was really convinced, really, really, really loved what was in there. But it was very interesting because as I went through that process, there were many times that I had said something that I really believed and I thought for a long time. And then I end up reading a bunch of papers and it's kind of true, but uh, the it's actually more complicated than I thought. And you're and so there's so many things in there that are like two sentences now that I know it took me like half a day to just like figure out what I was going to say. Because some of these things really do have rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. So so that's one. So I think in terms of your larger, your larger question, you're trying to simplify the message to the degree possible. Because if you put in every caveat, this was the other thing when I started writing the book, is you know, some of the people who are really good writers and that gave us advice or, you know, helped us in this first foray into this, you know, this kind of an effort as scientists, we're very prone to caveat everything. So yes. we, we don't get out what we're trying to say because we're caveating it before and after, because there's always exceptions and there's yeah. always except in this case, and it's not exactly like this. And mm -hmm. as scientists, we're so trained that way. And within our scientific communities, that makes a lot of sense because you're just being so careful about every word that you say. And you're trying to, you know, be as accurate as possible. Now, when you start doing public communication, you can't do that. If you caveat everything, it's so boring and hard to understand that people will just not listen to it. So you you have to learn how to say things more clearly, but you can do that in a way where you're still saying what is true. And you can follow the same, you can actually get to the caveats or the exceptions, but you have to follow it in a narrative where someone might ask a follow-up question or, or once you've 
laid out the main point you're trying to make, you can then address, you know, there's a few exceptions and talk about mm-hmm. it, but you can't try to do it all within the same statement. Otherwise, you never state anything clearly and no one comes away with a clear message of what you're actually trying to say. So, yeah. so it's something that I'm trying to get, you know, get better at and we're doing tons of podcasts and things like yeah, this yeah. these days to to get that message out. But it was an incredible experience to write the book and, and just get the process going. Yeah, I uh I mean a lot of my day job in the private sector has to do with explaining things and answering questions and educating the public or or just my colleagues. And I remember this one time a couple years after I moved from the academic world to the private sector, I was in a one-on-one meeting with someone and they were like, "Nick, like we love you. Uh you, you know, your job is to explain things and and to make sure we know what's going on. That's great, but your answer to everything can't be it's complicated. <laughs> and so exactly. like what I what I learned to do is sort of say directionally what's true. You know, this is true for most people most of the time, we think. And I can use the word but one time. Like th- this is true for most people most of the time, but there could be exceptions here. But yep. you can't you can't turn every question into a book length answer with every possible caveat because you just end up saying it, it it sounds like you're saying nothing in the end. It's the joke about science. The, the end of every scientific paper is more research is needed. And at some level, and we get into this too, especially as we develop products, right? So you've asked a couple of questions as we've gone along around products or trying to get things out to people. And, and I think you have to do that. Like you have to figure out ways to take what we've learned and it's always imperfect and there's always more to learn, but at some level you have to take the leap and say, okay, I think, you know, we know enough about the microbiome. It's really worth generating a test and telling people what they can learn from it. Like, I think that becomes something that is essential and important. Otherwise you can't take action. Even, even myself in my own position with, you know, and having run a lab for many years before I, uh, especially, you know, before I became chief science officer at Thorne and it's, you know, in doing all of those things, but even I can't really action on all the things that I understand without turning it into a pro- It's just, it's too hard. You have to make it simple and actionable and give people information and ability to move forward. Uh, and we just have to be able to take those, those leaps. So to your earlier question, you know, you were bringing up, you know, Andrew Huberman or people like that, that are out popularizing and yes, people can take issue with a couple, you know, if, from any of these, you know, you know, great science communicators of, well, you know, that didn't quite capture all the nuances, or I'm a super expert in this area, and you didn't really capture that. And I'm very much on the on the side of the people that are out there communicating and trying to say it. There's such a huge difference between trying to accurately convey something that is complicated in a simple way versus someone that is, you know, really out in left field and 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 pushing something that is nonsense. You see that as well. But I, yeah, but I'm very sympathetic to those that are, you know, really fighting the good fight and trying to get things out. And is there going to be a mistake here or there, or lack, or there's not enough depth on a topic or two? A hundred percent. And the same will be the same is true for me. So I'd like yeah. to be generous to them as I hope others are with me, and we try to get to what is the, uh, you know, what's the truth, and that's what we're all trying to figure out is what's true and what's helpful to us in our own lives. And um, so you said your book is for a general audience. Um, what about, you know, you know, I imagine that many, you know, a good chunk of the people who read it will actually be physicians and maybe even you intended that to be part of the audience. How would you, how would you like, um, someone like uh, a physician or a nurse or someone who works in healthcare to, to take in your book and digest it and, and what, what should they come away with? Yeah. Physicians are definitely one of the, the biggest audiences that we hope to reach with the book. And in fact, I've gotten a lot of nice notes over the past week or so since the book came out from physicians who have read it and and liked it, and you know, we've gotten into further discussions with with a number of them, which has been which has been great. So, the age of scientific wellness is a very you know, it has an expansive vision, and it fundamentally we want to see a pretty big refactoring of the way that healthcare is done into a wellness paradigm versus a disease paradigm. And 
there's no chance that that happens over a really short period of time. And because the scale of what's going on in healthcare is so large and it's so disease centric, but finding allies within the ranks of physicians and nurses and other healthcare uh, practitioners is hugely important. And I think it's, it's so important that we are able to embrace approaches that will better align how the economics of healthcare systems to what's really beneficial for our health. And there are many incentives that are not aligned in terms of, you know, maximizing our health span, right? If you could actually eliminate, you know, if you could seriously reduce chronic disease across the board, a lot of people would make a lot less money under the current scenario, right? These things are not, you know, it's not aligned uh, in terms of, you know, maximizing health and maximizing, um, you know, economics for you know, healthcare systems and so forth. And so I would like to see as many of, you know, leaders in these various different areas to become acquainted with at least the arguments that we're making in the book. I think there'll be a you know, it's already started to catalyze uh, a lot of those discussions, which I think is is helpful and useful. And there'll be a long path of trying to figure out how do we make these things viable and working in a way that it really benefits you know, everybody, and especially you know all of us. And that's why when we talk about this, you know, medicine as P four, um, which is predictive, right? So we want to be able to say something about what you know what are the risks that are coming preventive, how do we stop them from coming? Personalized because it is specific to every individual and participatory, which is the last one. And the reason that's so important is that it's really each of us that ultimately bears all the benefit and risk of our own health. And that ultimately is the only person that's completely aligned, you know, other than perhaps loved ones, right? That is completely aligned with you know, what is the best, you know, for you and your health. And so that is part of the reason also that we wrote the book was just that we think that there has to be a lot of, of demand that, that, that we do for the way that we interface with healthcare to push it in a way that is as aligned with our own health needs as possible. Uh, because that's really what people deserve is to have uh, systems that are serving uh, their interests to the best that we can possibly do. What, um, so, you know, with like one of the tests that's available through Thorn that people could actually go out there and buy and use and try out, what's an example from your own life where you were really surprised by something where you got a result about your microbiome or about your diet? that, you know, maybe something was off that you wouldn't have expected to be off, or you realized you had to make some kind of change that you weren't even thinking about before. Yeah. I can go back a, a few years and um, I'll do an, I've had both negative and positive surprises. So a negative surprise I had some years ago uh, was that I had become pre-diabetic and I had not been aware of that. This was before I really got into uh, a lot of the you know, health space, you know, more personally. And that was a bit of a wake up call to see, you know, how poorly my body was doing at regulating carbs. I had, uh, as a younger person, done way too much on processed sugars. I had gained significant weight. My metabolism was terrible. My knees were horrible. I couldn't straighten my knees without severe pain. I couldn't walk without pain. I couldn't stand without pain. I couldn't sit without pain. It was horrible uh, on that front. But, you know, on the earlier times, but just being able to open up, you know, on some of the, on some of the measurements, it was, you know, eye opening to see how many of my body systems were messed up. And I was much too young for that to be, to be happening. That was part of the motivation for getting into this space and, and making the progress that's come since then. Um, one of the really positive things I found so I went when I went through this was before Thorn. This was a company that I co-founded with with Lee Hood called Aravale, and I had gone through that program for four years, and then we developed the biological age score, which we ended up later commercializing at um, at Thorn. Um, 
but did a, a retrospective analysis on all the blood work as we were, and we published this in journals of gerontology of a, of a biological aging score. And when I did that, well, I'll just, I'll just say, so when I'd gone through Aravale, I had been, it made a huge difference in my health. I felt a lot better, but I had, I had lost a bunch of weight and regained it. I did the very typical, unfortunately, like yo-yo thing of down and then body just, you know, has a set point. And it just wants to go back up. And so I was very disappointed in myself for that, you know, that during that period. But it was interesting is that when I applied the biological age test to my blood scores, what it showed was that I had in fact reduced biological age on that measure relative to my chronologic age by two and a half years, every single year in that program for four hmm. years in a row. So my biological age just dropped 10 years. And that was eye-opening to me because I had felt like I had made some progress and, you know, some forwards some backwards some forwards and back, you know, and that I had been fighting to get, you know, healthier, but I hadn't quite gotten to where I really wanted to be. And, and yet the biological age as, you know, and just looking at it, told me the story of at least in the biochemistry, you're getting better, 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 better. And that was, you know, that was eye-opening in a positive way. That's one of the reasons we ended up launching the biological age test, because I found that so just personally motivating that it made me feel like, okay, my journey is going better than I thought. And I, you know, I'm just kind of re-motivating to, to start, um, you know, and push that even harder. So, so I think it can, it can be revealing in a, in a negative way, right? I also found, you know, I have higher risk for Alzheimer's disease because I have ApoE4, one copy, not two. So I'm in the, the middle group, but that's motivating to say, okay, well, what are the factors that I can do to help prevent dementia? Mm -hmm. I have super high risk for macular degeneration, like 59 times average or something. Well, that's motivating to say, okay, well, let's learn a little bit more about that. What, you know, what can I do to mitigate that risk? And we go through that. So there's all kinds of things that that you go through that you can learn both negatively and positively in this kind of journey. Interesting. Um, and the book, so the book is out already. The book is out. Yeah, the book released officially about a week ago. Uh, and so it's available everywhere. Yeah. Is there, so just as a reminder for people too, so uh, Nathan was on the podcast previously uh, back in 2022. So episode 47, we talk about, about a lot of the stuff we talked about today, but I think we went into a lot more detail on certain things like aging and blood sugar physiology. So I would encourage people to go back and look at that one too, if they if they want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so I'll put a link to the book in the episode description and everything. Is there anything is there anything in the book that we haven't really touched on? Any major areas that you think are worth mentioning, um, or maybe in, just any interesting stories that that might whet people's appetite? So one one area we haven't really gotten into is uh, the role of AI. Mm. Uh, so we did just write a uh, an op ed or off of an excerpt of the book for the Wall Street Journal this last weekend. You know, if people want to check that out, it, it goes into it. But this is an area. Of that. If you're hearing this, you are listening to a premium episode of Mind and Matter. The first part of premium episodes are freely available to all listeners, and the full episode is available to premium subscribers at mindandmatter.substack.com. Premium episodes feature conversations with startup founders, executives, and other professionals at science-related companies. They involve discussion of not only the science and technology underpinning their businesses, but also other topics such as business operations and strategy, startup funding, and the practical applications around how they're using science and technology to create products or services to solve customer problems. Premium subscriptions help sustain the podcast and increase the quantity and quality of the content that I produce. However, I do not want anyone to miss out on learning from any of my guests just because they can't afford a paid subscription. If you're interested in hearing full premium episodes but can't afford a paid subscription, simply sign up for my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com, send me an email, and I will give you a free premium membership. As always, I thank you for your support. No matter how you engage with Minded Matter, the simplest and most effective way to provide support is to share your favorite episodes with family and friends.
This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure. And vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. 